Okay. Uh, you see how this works as we get further along. I don't, I don't back up so much when I do the review. But in, the, in 1 Peter, we're looking at 1 Peter in chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. Peter calls them to love as those who've been reborn through the word of God. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he commands them to remove various divisive sins from among them and to grow into salvation through ingesting the word of God. So he tells them, listen, he tells them love as those who've been born through the word of God. Get rid of these certain divisive sins and grow up into salvation through ingesting the word of God. And then when we ended last week, we were looking at chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. And I want to repeat a little bit of what I said last week about that, and then we'll we'll move on. But in chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, he says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men but chosen and precious in God's sight, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture... Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. The honor, therefore, is for you who believe. But to unbelievers, the stone which the builders rejected, this one has become the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble by being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession, in order that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You once were not a people, but now are a people of God. You had not received mercy, but now have received mercy. Peter tells these Gentile Christians, you remember he's writing to mainly Gentile Christians in Asia Minor, and he tells these Gentile Christians That as they convert to Christ, they're incorporated into a new spiritual temple being built by God, which is the church. He doesn't go into all that, but he's talking about this spiritual temple. And we know from 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about that that temple is the church. So as they come to Christ, they are incorporated into this new spiritual temple being built by God. And their incorporation into the new temple through faith is with the purpose of, of there being a holy priesthood that offers spiritual sacrifices to God rather than the physical sacrifices of the Jewish priesthood under the Old Covenant where they're sacrificing animals and all of these things. They have been called out and they have been incorporated into this temple. So they are the temple and they are a priesthood and they are to be offering these spiritual sacrifices rather than the physical sacrifices of the Jewish priesthood. And the nature of the spiritual sacrifices that Peter specifically has in mind is indicated in verse 9, where he says that the purpose of there being a royal priesthood is to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I'm convinced what he's talking about there, he is referring to the worship of God by his people, to their proclaiming of his praises to him in the assembly. And I mentioned this last week, as I said last week, we need you. We we're so worried, it seems to me. We're so worried about, you know, reducing Christianity to nothing more than our gatherings. We're sensitive to that. We don't want anybody to think, listen, uh, that's not all there is to Christianity. As soon as you mention it, that's not all there is to Christianity. And we're so worried about reducing Christianity to only our gatherings for worship that I think we have unintentionally undermined the significance of the gatherings, which is part, I think, of what's going on with people being dissatisfied. Because we've said, listen, it's, it's really nothing. It's no different than anything else. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're just coming together. No, no big deal. Because why? We don't want people to think it's special. Why? Because we're afraid that if they think it's special, our gathering together, if there's something spiritually significant, spiritually distinctive, well, then they'll become ritualistic. They, they'll think that's all there is to it. And all I will do then is I will offer God tokens of devotion by just coming here and I will then live any way I want. Ah, but you see, I'm at church on Sunday. And we fear that. Now, our response to that has been, don't think there's anything special about coming together. And I think that's a misstep. You see, it's, it, that's a false dichotomy, right? Can't we gather something about the grandeur of our gatherings? Can't we understand that? 
without, without meaning and saying that that doesn't mean you have to live right? right? Why, can't we, why can't we see that there is some special significance to our gathering? That there is something spiritually meaningful, distinctive, when the body of Christ comes together as it assembles and praises the God who delivered them, and then we don't have to turn around and say, well, then God cares only about your gatherings. He can care about both, right? He can care about both. In fact, holy living is a predicate to acceptable worship. How you live in the world and your daily life is a predicate to acceptable worship. God, it's all over the Bible. All over the Bible that God despises hypocritical worship. He despises worship by that offered by someone who comes and joins the community and sings praise to God, extols his greatness, says he is worthy of being honored and obeyed, and then turns around and lives a life that says, I don't care a thing about you, God. I'm going to live the way I want to. He says, when those people come before me, the impenitent who sit here and make themselves God, dishonor me, mock me in the way they live, and they think they can just come and gather and then offer praises to me, and I will then be pleased with that? He despises it. He despises it. And if you think I'm being too harsh in that assessment, just look at texts like Proverbs 15, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 to 17, Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 9 to 11, and Amos chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. And I think you'll see I'm not being too harsh in that assessment. Okay, so, so holy living, piety, seriousness, genuineness of faith, living out the calling, living consistently with your confession, that is a predicate for acceptable worship. When a body of people come together who truly are devoted to Christ, Okay, well, I see that's that's sweet. But if you're not so, so it's a false dichotomy. And what I'm saying to you is I think we have undermined inadvertently the significance of the assembly. And I think part of the consequence of that undermining is that people don't grasp the greatness of what it is we're doing. when We come together and then I think they're prone then to start nitpicking about things. As I said, if you could see. If, you, if I could have you look and see what it is we're doing, if you could see the holy vision and see the angels and all and the significance of what we're doing, I think those petty complaints would evaporate. Okay, so I think it's a very, a very important thing. All right, Peter says in verse 6, by reference to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, that the one who believes in Jesus... The chosen and precious cornerstone will never be put to shame. The one who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, that decision to trust in Christ. You're sitting here and you, you, know, you hear the gospel and you say, oh, oh yeah, I believe that's true. Will you, will you give Christ your life? Will you live for Jesus Christ? You say, all right, I'm in. I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple. I'm following the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that decision will never be put to shame. It will be vindicated. That decision to follow Christ, to give him your life, to live for him, when the world may look at you and say, this guy over here, he's been duped. He's following something stupid. He's been tricked by a lie. He's spending his life honoring God. And at the end, he's going, boy, I shouldn't have done that. That was really foolish of me. And I'm ashamed because I have been duped and suckered. And he says, the person's decision to trust in Christ will be vindicated. However it looks now, they look like they're saying, listen, they're getting pressured, they're being persecuted, they're being ranked on by the culture and everybody, you know, they're stupid, they can't this, they're enemies of the society and all that. He says, they will never be put to shame. And that's the truth. We will be vindicated. Our trust in Christ is not going to be one of these things. Or on that day, you're going to sit there and say, boy, I really was shown up to be a fool for having invested my life in serving God. That's not going to happen. We will be vindicated. We will never be put to shame. And then he says, by reference to Psalm 118, verse 22, and Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, he says that believers will be honored, but unbelievers, those who reject and who consequently stumble over God's chosen and precious cornerstone, they will, by implication, be put to shame. The believers will be honored. 
Those who reject and stumble over God's chosen and precious cornerstone, they're going to be put to shame. They stumble into disaster. You see, that's what stumbling means. It's not simply they stumble. Oh, I just kind of stumbled and I'm back up. They stumble into disaster. They fall off the cliff. And they stumble into disaster by being disobedient to the word, which means rejecting the gospel of Christ. You can see that meaning in chapter 3, verse 1. The husbands who disobey the word. What's he talking about? He's talking about unbelieving husbands. They disobey the word. They do not accept the gospel. And that's what he's talking about here. They stumble into disaster by refusing to accept the gospel. And the consequence of that disobedience has been set or appointed beforehand. In other words, contrary to how Calvinists would read this. I read this as saying, listen, it is not the disobedience that was set or appointed. It is the consequence of the disobedience that was set or appointed. So I share the view of John Elliott in his commentary in the Anchor Bible series. He says, that which is set or established by God is the stumbling resulting from not heeding the word rather than the disobedience itself. Or to express it differently, it is the result of disobedience that is foreordained, not the decision itself to disobey. Okay, so I don't think God is saying to these people, you're going to disobey. I'm going to make it that way and determine that you disobey. They're going to choose to disobey. And he says, I've determined that those who reject the gospel, this is their fate. Elliot continues, he says that the author presumes free will in accepting or rejecting Jesus as the Christ is evident from chapter two, verse 12, where he envisions that the honorable behavior of the believers might turn their accusers from slander to the glorifying of God. Similarly, in chapter three, verse one, it is anticipated that the holy behavior of wives might win their unbelieving husbands for the Christian faith. So I just wanted to I wanted to mention that because you see that thing about having been set or established by God. And that's what I think he's talking about. That's how I understand that. Now, these Gentiles, he says in verse 10, these Gentiles, they were not part of the people of God. That comes as no surprise. Right. In Paul's words in Ephesians, chapter two, verse 12. They formerly were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Right. I mean, they were out of the loop. God is over here doing something for the salvation of humanity through Israel. And the Gentiles were not part of that. They were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers to the covenants of the promise. They had no hope and were without God in the world. But what has happened to them? What has happened to them? See, now in Christ, they have received mercy. He says, You were once not a people, but now you are a people of God. You had not received mercy, but now have received mercy. That's all of us. Maybe not all of us, but that's most of us. See, what has happened? It is because through faith in Christ, we as Gentiles have been grafted into true Israel. You can see that in Romans chapter 11, verses 13 to 20. Who are the Gentiles? We have ethnic Israel. And then we have true Israel, which is a subset of ethnic Israel. True Israel are those believers in Christ who accepted God. They exhibited the faith of Abraham in believing God when he said, this is my son. Those who rejected God's word showed themselves not to be true Israel because they didn't have the faith of Abraham. So here we have ethnic Israel and then we have true Israel, which is a subset of ethnic Israel. And then into true Israel, the Gentiles are grafted when they come into the faith, when they accept the gospel and then share in Abraham's faith. They are grafted into the olive tree. Okay, so he's telling these Gentiles, listen to what's happened to you. You have been grafted. And once you were not a people, once you hadn't received mercy, but now we are. You've been grafted in true Israel, the subset of ethnic Israel, Gentiles grafted in. And this fusion is New Israel. You see, we are new Israel. We are the the church that has come in through Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles. Okay. now he then says in chapter two, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as strangers and sojourners to abstain from fleshly desires, which war against the soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles good In order that, in which case they malign you as evildoers, by observing your good works, they may glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, Peter here, he addresses them as beloved. 
And he's probably referring both to God's love for them as well as his own. And then he urges them as strangers and sojourners. Okay, strange resident aliens, strangers and sojourners to abstain from fleshly desires that war against the soul. They're like foreigners in their own land. You see, they grew up there, but they're still like foreigners. They're like strangers and sojourners. Why? Because of their allegiance to Christ. Here they are, you know, they grew up, they they knew Tom and Steve and everybody had the same background and upbringing. They become Christians, and because of that allegiance to Christ, they are now different. You see, they are different from those around them, those they grew up with. They're they're very different because of that allegiance to Jesus Christ as resident aliens generally in the society. And maybe this is true today. They were looked down on and discriminated against by native populations. So Christians, they had that same experience in their homelands. What are what's happening to them? You see, they grew up there yet because of their allegiance, they were transformed and now they're odd, different they have a different thing that, is, that, that calls them. They're focused on other things, so they're different from them, and the people are what? They're persecuting them. Just the way they would do if somebody who came in who was different for other reasons, somebody who moved there. So he says, listen, this is your lot. This is our lot. Do you understand? This is our lot. Is that you have people who look at you and they say, listen, that don't share our conviction of the truth of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, because that changes our whole perspective. Those who don't share that look at us and they say, you're different. You're different. And he urges them, listen, they are to, they're strangers and sojourners to abstain from these fleshly desires. See, Christians, this is important, I think, to grasp. I think you know it by experience. But it's good to see it, it written here. Christians, those who have God's spirit Living within, within them are not exempt from base desires. From desires for things that are contrary to the Spirit of God. Do I have to tell you that? <laughs> Do I? You no, know, no. See, I, if, you have the, if you have the least bit of introspection, you understand that, you know, you have these base desires that continue to pulse in your life. So we're not exempt from those things. Desires for things contrary to spirit. And you can see that in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25. You see, not exempt from those things. Indeed, these desires, they're so strong or can be so strong that Peter describes them here as what? Warring against the soul. That's pretty rough. Right? Warring against the soul. See, they're portrayed as an enemy that is attempting to overtake or to conquer believers. Here's what Schreiner said, a little comment I liked. He says, such desires must be resisted and conquered. Right? He commands them what? Abstain. Abstain. Yes, you're being pulled this way, but you need to abstain. You have a role to play. Schreiner says, and the image used implies that this is no easy matter. The Christian life is certainly not depicted as passive in which believers simply let go and let God. You see, we have a role to play in this. The Spirit of God is seeking to transform us, but that doesn't mean we simply act on every impulse. We have to grab ourselves sometimes and say, listen, I'm doing what's right. Do you see this over? You attempt to do that? Yeah, I am, but you're going this way, dude. You see, you are, I am going to discipline myself and live to the honor of Christ and not yield to these things, these desires that are warring against the soul. No, no, no. I'm going to fight in this war. I'm not just going to sit here and say, okay, I'll just kind of float along and then wind up and say, well, what do you know? You know, I just wound up in the back seat with my girlfriend and, well, you know, I don't know. I just, uh, mm -mm. you see, this is, this is a war. And if we're going to take it seriously, we have to recognize that we have a role to play and it's not simply passive and we don't just sit there and say, all right, listen, uh, that's all I'm going to do. You know, that's, that's all I'm going to wind up doing. I'm just going to sit here and, and uh, you know, play no role or have no role to play in this. Now, this is no easy matter. Now, when he talks about the soul, there are a lot of commentators. I could give you in a half a dozen names. I'm with those guys in understanding when he refers to soul, 
the soul against which the fleshly desires war as the whole person again. See, rather than the immaterial part of one's being, like Michael's, David's, Actemeyer, Shriner, Job's, on and on. And I think he's talking about, listen, your person is at risk. The whole being is at risk. In Shriner's words, he says, the whole person is in view, showing that sinful desires, if they're allowed to, to triumph, ultimately destroy human beings. So if you're here and you sit here and you say, here are these impulses. No, I'm just going to yield. I'm going to reject the will of God in my life. I'm not going to resist or abstain. I'm just going to go with the flow, baby. I have all of these things. There will be no struggle in my life. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't struggle against these things because I yield to them. When I see something that I want, I go after it, even if God doesn't want me to have it. Okay, he's saying that when that happens, what is the net effect? The net effect is that you're rejecting God. Okay, so this is what I think he's talking about. Now, if you think the soul here is limited to the immaterial part of a human being, well, then he's saying that fleshly desires or sinful desires war against that specific aspect, presumably by weakening its resolve. But either way, we are called to abstain from sinful desires. Okay, we we have to say this. We have to get people to understand this. That when you said yes to Jesus Christ, you entered into something. You entered into the revolution. And you are to live radically righteous lives. So, you know, you wouldn't expect any revolutionary to take something opposed to the revolution. He is, he, you know, with a grain of say, that's no big deal, I don't care. No, it's going to be serious. There's going to be great struggles about it. Let me read to you a comment I thought was insightful by a guy named I. Howard Marshall. He says, Normally, the alien is someone who's visiting a country to which he does not in any sense belong. The readers, however, used to belong to the country in which they're now aliens. If we want to stretch the metaphor to make it fit, we could think in terms of a person who visits a country and there falls in love with and marries one of the local people. The spouse, the local person, now adopts the nationality and way of life of the alien And ceases to belong to the country where he or she still resides. That's what happened to us, right? I mean, we live here. We grew up here. We're wired and plugged in and webbed and all that. And then we have this transcending allegiance to Jesus Christ. But we're still here with all of these historical and deep attachments that we grew up in. He says, clearly a break of this kind involving a conversion that makes people no longer citizens of their own country but resident aliens within it is all the more difficult to carry through. The temptation to go back to the old way of life must be immensely strong. Isn't that what we face? Isn't that what we face all the time with people pulling contacts, connections? You know, we're embedded. If you went somewhere else and were isolated culturally already, it would be some one thing. But we're plugged in, baby. And so that's just the enemy just uses that. To start pulling and pulling. Peter tells him in verse 12 to live such good lives among the Gentiles, meaning the pagans, the unbelievers. Yes, they were Gentiles, but now they are the people of God. So he tells them to live such good lives among the Gentiles, among the unbelievers, that though they falsely accuse them of doing evil, they will, by observing their good works, glorify God on the day of visitation. You live such good lives. So that though they wrongly accuse you of acting poorly and doing wrong, you're going they're going by observing your works, how well you are living, how nobly you are living, that they will glorify God on the day of visitation. And the thought seems to be that by living good lives in the presence of unbelievers, they may lead to the conversion of former accusers. See, people who were lying and slandering them and hostile toward them. If they would live such good lives, the thought is, is that you may lead to the conversion of some of these people so that as converts, they then will be part of the chorus glorifying God when he visits in the return of Christ to finalize history. They now will be with you by seeing your good works, your noble deeds. You will influence them. You have a tremendous evangelistic impact on them by living so differently from the world. They go, Who are these people? What got hold of these people? Why do they live this way? 
Why do they sacrifice for one another? Why are they so uh, merciful? Why are they this, 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 this? I don't know anybody who lives like that. You see, and this draws people. And the hope is that some of them wind up, they will wind up being converted and glorifying God on that day. Here's how Karen Jobes in her commentary in the Baker exegetical series, she says, The day of visitation should probably be understood as a reference to the future final judgment, by which time Peter hopes that unbelievers who have observed the good works of the Christians they have slandered will have come to have faith and come to to faith in Christ. Then about a page later, she says, a primary purpose of the self-controlled life is its evangelistic value for attesting to the truth of the Christian gospel. Abstain from sinful desires. Live such good, honorable, noble, holy lives that you will influence other people in the cause of Christ. You see, he tells us, and she goes on, she says, the winsome way of life of Peter's readers, even in the midst of a difficult social situation, is hoped to be the witness that would bring unbelievers into the Christian community so that they too might glorify God on the coming day of judgment. You see, so you, you wind up, the function here is parallel, right, to the function that you see of, of godly wives, the call on wives in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, to live in such a way that the unbelieving husbands may be won over by what, seeing their, their, their pure and reverent conduct? It's parallel to that. It's an analogy to that. That you are so morally and ethically distinct from the world that people take notice and they're drawn to it. And when we start looking for reasons why the church isn't growing, why people seem less attracted to Christianity, why don't we start here? Okay, why don't we start here and start saying, is the church living the way the church should be living? Are we radically righteous in our lives so that people notice and say, listen, these people are different. The world lives this way. No, no, these people, you got to see how they live, how they serve, what they do for one another, how gracious they are. You see, this is something a fellow named Ronald Sider in his book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience. He said that polls show that Protestants who claim to take the Bible and their faith seriously, in other words, a a subset of Protestants called evangelicals, those who claim to take the Bible and their faith seriously, polls show that they divorce their spouses just as often as their secular neighbors, beat their wives as often as their neighbors, and are almost as materialistic and even more racist than their pagan friends. Now, What effect do you think that has on people? If we live like the world, you say, well, you know, we're we're just all people. You know, we're just all people. You know, we're all just sinners. And so I don't. Okay, I understand that. But do you see there's something about the call of a Christian to live a radically righteous life? Will you be perfect? Of course not. Will you sin? Yes, you will. But can you not see that there can be some distinction? If you look at the history of the early church, the power of the life that they lived was tremendous on people. How they loved one another, how they cared for the widows, how they they didn't, you know, there weren't family bonds here. There were spiritual bonds. And in that world, it was like, what are they doing? Why are they caring for these people? Why are they paying the fees to bury these people? What is up with them? Well, that's what it is, because they serve Jesus Christ and he calls us to be that kind of person. Here is what Sider says. Scandalous behavior is rapidly destroying American Christianity. By their daily activity, most, quote, Christians regularly commit treason. With their mouths, they claim that Jesus is Lord, but with their actions, they demonstrate allegiance to money, sex and self-fulfillment. Now, you're out, you're living with your boyfriend or girlfriend. In the first place, some brother or sister ought to be talking to you and urging you to repent. Okay? If you refuse to repent, the church needs to get involved. Okay? That's how it goes. Okay? That's how it is. But if you're doing that, what kind of effect do you think you're having on people? They say, you know, it's like, listen, you don't want to take this Christianity stuff too seriously. 
That's like John had many years ago. He was out evangelizing in New Jersey and ran into somebody and who said, what, John, you got to you got to be careful about taking that Bible too seriously. It'd drive you crazy. What he said? All right. Got to know when to pull back. That's what the guy told him. You see, you don't you, 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 it'll drive you crazy. You see, you can't you can't do that. OK, we have to be we have to be people who are recognizably distinct. OK, that doesn't. So then you say, oh, you get a big head and you look down on everybody and you're hostile toward them and judgmental. toward. Them. No, we're trying to honor God. Right. We're trying to honor God and Peter and elsewhere. You see that. Listen, that is an important element. If we're going to if we're going to affect the world, the world looks at us and sees what the Rotary Club. You got a group of people get together, live just like everybody else and see by living like everybody else. What you are saying is, I don't really believe it. That's the message. It may not be what you intend to say, but I'm telling you, the message that goes out is I don't really believe it. If you really believe the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you, he calls you to live holy, honorable, noble lives in every aspect. How can you thumb your nose at him and just go over here and just live in impenitent sin? Just live and say, listen, I don't care. Yeah, 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 I know it's wrong for me to steal from my employer, but it really helps my bottom line. I'm just going to keep doing it. How can you do it? Yeah, I know it's great to get stoned, drunk. You know, uh, I like it. I like it. Intoxication's grand. Okay? So how can you do that? You know, do you not know that the one who bought you, he calls you and says, listen, that's got to go. There's only room for one Lord. One Lord. And I'm calling you to come and die. You come live my way. You come follow me. And you're going to find that I know much more about this life than you do. Okay? You're going to find that I know much more about this life. So you come on. But I think it's crucial there. I think it's very important that we understand this, this link, this connection here. That you see between our lives and how we are to live. And if we just tolerate this and just say, that's perfectly fine. Well, you know, everybody's weak. I know people are weak. I know I'm weak. But do you see there is a difference between being weak and not caring? Right? There's a difference between being weak. The weak person gets up and hobbles again. He gets up and keeps walking towards the Father. It is the rebel who says, listen, that stuff's for saps. I'm living the way I want to live. I don't care what God wants. It's about me, baby. Do you see a difference in attitude? The one who says, ah, Father, forgive me. All right. I'm back. I'm I'm walking. Ah, this is this is our life, right? Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. But where are we walking? We're walking toward God. Right. And he's just there. Come on. Like a little baby, come on, just keep coming to me. You just keep your eye on me and you keep living and taking seriously how I want you to live. That's completely different from the person who says, frankly, I don't care how he wants me to live. I like this more than I like God. Okay, well, do you see what that is? That's that's idolatry. You have another God. And it's just that crucial and that important. Okay. He says in chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, he says, Submit to every human creature on account of the Lord, whether to a king as being supreme or to governors as those sent by him for punishment of those who do evil and praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God. By doing good, you are to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Do so as free people, yet not as those viewing freedom as a cloak for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, the good conduct that they are to exhibit among pagans, part of this holy living that we are to show to the pagan world, it includes submitting to the emperor, that's who the king is, the emperor, and to the various governmental authorities that the emperor appoints. Okay, so it's this idea of governmental authority the Christian's participation in the inaugurated kingdom of God 
Yes, Jesus has brought the kingdom. Yes, we are participants in that. But our participation in that inaugurated kingdom doesn't free us from obligations to secular authority. You could see how some people would think that, right? No, no, no. I'm already here. I'm, I'm participating in the kingdom. See, I'm not of this world. So what do I have to do with the local political rulers? And he says, that's not how it is. There is a function for political authority in this overlap of ages. You see, this is part of how they're to exhibit their, their good conduct among the pagans. As Paul spells out more fully in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 5, he says, Christians must submit to governmental authorities. Why? Because those authorities, those positions, that office, authority, the concept of authority within the society has been established by God. He established authority within human societies to be a blessing by pre- preventing anarchy and chaos. You know, I watched some show about, uh, I think it was Liberia uh, recently. And you can just see, right? No, who wants to be in part of, you know, when, there's, when there's anarchy, it's bad. I mean, it's kill or be killed. It's the strong just taking whatever you have and doing how, to you whatever they want. And so God has instituted authority that there will be government on site that will rule and regulate these things. So it is intended, the authorities created, that it would be a blessing. And he says, see, that the governmental authority, it punishes those who do evil in the sense of those who rebel against it. And it commends those who do good in the sense of contribute to the order that the government seeks to maintain. So God has done this. Now, now these authorities are called what? Human creatures. That's an interesting phrase, and I think why he's doing it, he's saying, listen, you need to keep in mind that however high and mighty these authorities are, whether it be the emperor, whether it be the local guy here, however high and exalted they are in society and culture, what are they? They're creatures. They are creatures who have been made by God, and they exist under his rulership. You see? Every human creature, and I think that's why he's mentioning that, and the Christian submission to the governmental authorities, it doesn't depend on the goodness of the particular ruler. You see, it depends on the fact that the ruler occupies the position of authority that God established within that society. When Paul wrote Romans, and when Peter wrote First Peter, the emperor of Rome was Nero. Now, Nero is an evil guy. I mean, the the full extent of his wickedness uh, doesn't become known for a little while. But there was already plenty of stuff to know. This guy's he's not good. Okay, so he's the one who's there. And they're saying, listen, it doesn't depend on that. You see, it is that he is in the position of authority. God sometimes allows. He sometimes allows or sometimes brings evil people into the position of authority. He has created in a society for His reasons. He will allow that to happen. You see, as Paul says in Romans 9, 17, God raised up the wicked Pharaoh. Why? That he might be glorified through displaying his power against him. You see, Jesus, he says, Jesus told Pilate in John 19, 11, that he would have no authority over him if it wasn't given to him from above. He wouldn't have any authority. And you see the same idea of God being the one who brings these people, you see it in several places in Daniel chapter 4, but God holds these evil rulers accountable for their wickedness. So he sometimes will allow or bring somebody there for some purpose, and it's like other things. You say, why is there suffering? Why is it? God is doing things that, as much as we hate it, are oftentimes beyond our grasp and perception. You simply have to understand that. I mean, that's the the take-home message of Job. You see, Job is sitting here and he's Job is suffering horribly. Right. I mean, the reader of Job is let in on the fact that God is doing something in Job's suffering to which Job is not privy. That's us. He's doing something. Okay, we know as readers, he's doing something. But Job just knows I'm dying here. I'm losing my family. I'm losing my property. I'm losing my health. I'm getting killed. And you have to see when, when Job sits here and you know, God appears to him and he says what? Basically, he says, Job, you know, uh, 
Do you like the, do you like how I hung the, you know, the stars and the quasars and how I did all that stuff? Do you see that I might have a little bigger perspective on things than you do? Do you understand that I'm God and you're not? And that's the hardest thing. I've told you before, a friend of mine who, who's from here, Ron Burnett, who's, his wife died of breast cancer in about six months. And then his mother died unexpectedly the next day. And I remember Ron's line to me that's always stuck. He said, there are times when reason doesn't reach far enough. And so he just trusted that despite how this looked, that God loves him and is for him. And see, that's the message of the cross that shouts across the centuries. However, this thing may look, you hold on to the fact that God is for you. You see, so that's this idea. You know, when you sit and you say, well, what, what's going on? You know, when he brings your lousy, but he will hold these evil rulers to account. He's doing something with them that you and I can't perceive. And it frustrates us. But that's when you just have to sit here and bow and say, listen, I'm not God. I trust you, Father, in your goodness. I trust you that this is something that needed to be allowed. OK, now that's hard, but that's part of where Christian living really goes. OK. As I said on Wednesday, I mean, it, the Christian life is something deep. It's something transformative. It is not this shallow, you know, uh, coat hanger in your mouth, smiling. Uh, I'm all for smiling. OK, but life is a lot, you know, it is a lot deeper and richer and all. And the Christian faith is not this shallow thing. It is this deep thing. And you face those kinds of things in your life. And, and uh, you know what I'm talking about. Now, here, you know, you have these God holds into account. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, what he's grazing out on the back 40. Right. He says, OK, he's going to, you know, he's sitting here and he's doing his thing. Uh, he loses his mind, winds up living like a wild animal, the great king until he until he repents. And then his kingdom is restored to him. God used the Assyrians to judge Israel. He used the Babylonians to judge Judah. But what happens to them? Right. He judges them. You see, in Isaiah chapter 10, you see the book of Habakkuk and the ultimate punishment they will see will receive will be in the final judgment. OK, so you see these things. God is working these things. But I just want you to see when we see something like this about submitting to governmental authorities, you start thinking, wait a minute. There have been some awful crazy ones. Now, I'm going to talk next week that none of this means that we ever submit to something that is contrary to the will of God. God is God. We make an idol of nothing. Okay? Thanks for coming.